My name is Tony Coverdale and I am Chair of the Salt for Brass Mill project. This short presentation, the Bristol Brass Company, 18th Century Origins, describes the early years of the company which owned and operated Saltford Mill. It is the first of four presentations on the brass industry and addresses the origins of the brass company, the drivers for its formation, the markets it sought to supply, the methods of brass production, the sources of raw materials and the people who worked in the industry. The strapline of glorious revolution to industrial revolution reflects upon the fact that the 1688 glorious revolution led to the repeal of a number of monopolies which created the conditions in which the Bristol Brass Company could flourish and that the technical advances made by the company sowed the seeds for the industrial revolution. But this was not without a social cost. The market into which the brass industry sold its wares was the West Africa trade, the slave trade. Saltford Mill is a scheduled monument located on the River Avon midway between Bristol and Bath. And the mill was in use as a brass mill for over 200 years, from 1721 until 1925. And in the first half of the 18th century was operated by a large conglomeration, the Bristol Brass Company. When Saltford Mill was leased by the Bristol Brass Company in 1721, the company was already operating multiple sites engaged in different parts of the copper and brass production process. The company had been founded in 1702 at Baptist Mills to the north of Bristol on the River Froom, which was to be their headquarters until 1814. It was also the site where brass was made by alloying copper and zinc. The brass company acquired copper from a smelting plant at Conham on the River Avon, which had been established by Abraham and Elton in 1696. The brass company increased copper production by the establishment of an additional smelting works downstream of Conham at Cruise Hole in 1710. And the brass company had three battery mills in operation by 1711. Down Mill on the River Chew in Canesham, which had been acquired in 1705, and mills at Woodborough, also on the River Chew, and Weston on the River Avon. The acquisition of Saltford brought the estate up to four battery mills. To put the brass industry into historical context, the Bristol Brass Company was formed in 1702 in the reign of Queen Anne, with Saltford Mill being a later acquisition, leased in 1721 in the reign of King George I. The company was contemporary with the Avon navigation, which made the River Avon navigable between Bath and Bristol. But the Brass Company was formed over a century before the opening of the Kennet and Avon Canal, which was not completed until 1810 in the reign of George III and Saltford Mill had been in use as a brass mill for over 115 years when the Great Western Railway acquired land from the company and the railway was laid a few yards west of the mill in the reign of William IV. And Saltford Mill had been in use as a brass mill for around 145 years when the Midland Railway branch line was opened in the reign of Queen Victoria, which passes to the east of Saltford Mill on the opposite bank of the river and which is now the Sush Trans Cycle Path. So what was made by the brass company? In the first instance, the company made pans and kettles, known generically as hollowware. The names of the products was also indicative of their intended market. A kettle was a bucket-like utensil with a handle for carrying or suspending it over an open fire. The kettles made by the brass company were called guinea kettles, referring to their intended market, i.e. trade with guinea in West Africa. The company also manufactured basins called Lisbon pans, referring to the style of pan traded by the Portuguese, also into West Africa. And a third type of utensil was a Neptune, described as large, thin and flat, again in demand in West Africa. Unfortunately, no examples of Neptunes have survived in the UK. The Brass Mill Project's collection includes a small pan known as a compass bowl. The design is based on the casing of a ship's compass brass being eminently suitable for this purpose, being non-magnetic. This is further evidence of the company's links with seaborne trade. The most telling artefacts in the project's collection are a number of manilas and African arm rings. The artefacts have carved tags attached to them, indicating that they were owned by the Harford and Bristol Brass Company. Harford has been the owner of the Bristol Brass Company in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. 
The Manillas are described as being the currency of the Ivory and Gold Coast and the currency of the Bonny district of Nigeria. The arm rings are described as African and were possibly made in West Africa by reworking items of brass that have been traded there. A reference from 1866 states, immense quantities of a species of money known as Manillas were at one time produced by casting. Manillas, once made in tons, are the circulating medium of the natives of the Gold Coast and it was exported to the Spanish settlements on the New and Old Calabar and the Bonny Rivers in Africa. In addition to that produced in Birmingham, it was largely manufactured by the Bristol House of Harfords. An 18th century European traveller to West Africa wrote, This people of all metals love brass. They make great rings to wear about their wrists. So taken are they with this base metal, that if a man lay down before them a piece of gold worth two pounds sterling and a piece of brass worth two pence, they will leave the gold and take the brass. European merchants have been trading brass with West Africa for some 250 years before Bristol merchants engaged in the trade on a large scale. In the history of the world in a hundred objects, Neil McGregor, the former director of the British Museum, chose a 15th century brass plaque as one of the objects. The plaque is made from brass exported from Europe around 1450, which is melted down and recast using the lost wax method by African artists. The plaque depicts the King of Benin in Nigeria, the Oba, with two Portuguese traders. Portuguese traders arrived in Benin in the 1400s, where they traded brass manilas made in continental Europe for pepper, ivory and slaves. And the collection of the Bristol City Museum contains the head of a Benin Oba, cast in brass, dated between 1600 and 1800. It is highly likely that brass objects manufactured by the Bristol Brass Company were used to produce art objects such as these in West Africa. The trade with West Africa was described by Thomas Phillips, the master of a Bristol-based merchant ship, who published his journal in 1694 describing a voyage from England to Africa and forward to Barbados. Phillips describes the trading arrangements in the port of Awaida in Benin, stating cowries were essential, the smaller the more esteemed. The next in demand are brass Neptunes or basins, very large, thin and flat. Certain textiles were also acceptable, but only to a limited extent. Near half the cargo value must be cowries and brass basins to set off the other goods. In the century following Philip's voyage, the trade between Bristol, West Africa and the West Indies became much more sophisticated. Bristol-based merchant venturers financed the chartering of ships and the purchase of cargoes to trade in West Africa, with the objective of making a profit from the triangular voyage. Letters of instruction from merchant venturers to the masters of chartered ships described what cargoes to purchase in Bristol and from whom, where to purchase the slaves in West Africa and how many slaves it was estimated could be bought where to sell the slaves in the West Indies, on what price was expected, and what cargoes to purchase for return to Bristol. A letter of 1785 describes a cargo valued at £1,226, which was estimated to buy 250 slaves in Bonny in West Africa, approximately £5 per person. The selling price in the West Indies was £20 per person, noting that £1 in 1750 equates to approximately £220 at 2019 prices. The inventory includes 500 weight of brass Neptunes, 1500 weight of manilas and 1000 copper rods totaling £146 to be bought from the Bristol Brass Company, just over 10% of the cargo. European trade with West Africa was dominated by the Portuguese in the 15th and 16th centuries with the Dutch rising in ascendancy in the 17th century. Merchants from those nations obtained brass from the major production area in what is now Belgium and Germany. Brass was produced in the cities of Aachen and Stolberg using zinc mined at Kelmis, and hollowware was manufactured in battery mills on the river Meuse in places such as Liège, Namur and Dinan. It was with this industry that the Bristol Brass Company was to compete. Turning now to the creation of Bristol's brass industry, its inception was prevented by three royal charters of the 16th and 17th centuries. The 1660 Charter of the Royal Africa Company 
created a monopoly on trade with Africa, which excluded Bristol merchants. Without access to the West Africa trade, Bristol merchants had no demand for brass, hence there was no incentive for creation of a brass industry. Had that demand existed, two further charters from the time of Queen Elizabeth prevented the creation of a new brass company. These were the 1565 Company of Mineral and Battery Works and the 1568 Society of Mines Royal. The charters created two monopolies which restricted the manufacture of hollowware, the mining of copper and the mining of calamine, both needed for making brass. But the glorious revolution of 1688 was a turning point. In that year James II abdicated and William and Mary were installed as joint monarchs, albeit with much reduced authority. Subsequent parliamentary acts created the conditions in Bristol for creation of the brass industry. The 1689 Mines Royal Act repealed the two Elizabethan monopolies, specifying that no copper mine was to be adjudged a royal mine, and the 1697 Trade with Africa Act repealed the Royal Africa Company's monopoly, so opening the West Africa market to Bristol merchants and creating a demand for copper and brass. This graph shows a plot of English exports of copper and brass to Africa in the 18th century. The plot shows that in the early decades of the century, material was being re-exported, having been acquired from continental manufacturers. But later in the century, the Africa trade came to be reliant on metals produced in England. Superimposed on this plot are the date of foundation of the Bristol Brass Company and the acquisition of Saltford Mill. It can be seen that in the early decades, exports and re-exports were evenly matched. But in the third decade of the century, English production accelerated with reliance on continental suppliers being very much diminished. In this talk, we shall focus on the early decades when the Bristol Brass Company made many of its technical advances and which were to lead to the company being referred to as the Great Brass Company by a Swedish observer, Reinhold Angerstein, when he visited the Avon Valley in 1754. The creation of a Bristol-based brass industry required not only a market for the brass, but also investment in the plant and skills to perfect production. Turning first to copper, Abraham Elton was a merchant venturer who, in partnership with Gabriel Wayne as his technical director, established a copper smelting plant at Conham in 1696. Further developments in copper smelting came from the Costa family. In 1685, Arthur Costa had established a lead smelter at Rownham on the River Avon, using a new type of furnace fired with coal. Arthur's brother, John, adapted the furnace for smelting copper, working first at Upper Redbrook on the River Wye before establishing a smelter at Cruz Hole. Investment to create the Brass Company came from a group of Quakers, Edward Lloyd, Benjamin Cool, Arthur Thomas and John Andrews, with Abraham Darby as their technical director, responsible for the company's early development. In parallel with developments in brass production, Darby also formulated ideas for working with iron and left the Brass Company in 1708 to establish the ironworks at Colebrookdale. He was succeeded in the Brass Company by a fellow Quaker, Nehemiah Champion. Champion was an agent for the sale of iron to Bristol merchant venturers and continued to be a major purchaser of a Darby's iron output. As technical director of the Brass Company, however, Champion went on to introduce a number of patented innovations in the following decades. Turning now to the manufacture of brass, brass is an alloy of copper and zinc, and the production process is complex, involving a range of activities and skills, as this diagram shows. So taking the process step by step, the first step is to obtain metallic copper. Copper ore was obtained from Cornwall and Devon. Tin miners had been sinking deeper mines in search of richer lodes and increasingly encountered copper ore. They were aware of what the ore was, but were unable to process it, as the smelting of copper demands a large amount of fuel which was not readily available. It takes at least four tonnes of coal to process one tonne of ore. The ore was therefore discarded as useless waste known as podder. The Bristol smelters had access to Kingswood coal and so bought the available podder at low prices for transport to Bristol for smelting, it being more cost effective to take the ore to the fuel. In 1724, the Swedish traveller Henrik Kalmeter visited the West Country and recorded in his journal the industrial processes he observed. 
Each of the mines indicated by a red dot was a mine observed by CalMeter to be financed by Bristol investors. The predominant copper ore was chalcopyrite or copper pyrites, which is a compound of copper, iron and sulphur. Only about 2% of what is mined is copper, and it is the extraction process which demands heat and hence fuel. The extraction process is complex, but in essence it involves concentration to mechanically separate the ore from the surrounding material known as gang, roasting to drive off sulphur and also arsenic present alongside the chalcopyrite, smelting by adding a flux which preferentially binds to the iron to separate the iron from the copper which involves melting of the charge at around 1500 degrees centigrade, hence the need for large quantities of fuel. Oxidation to remove the remaining iron and sulphur, and finally reduction to remove the oxygen. Concentration was carried out near to the mining site to avoid the wasted cost of transporting gang. The ore was crushed either by hand or using a water-driven stamp mill. The ore was then separated from the gang by hand or using a buddle to separate out the ore by sedimentation. Much of the manual work was carried out by women, known as ball maidens. Copper ore was transported by sea and river to the smelting sites on the River Avon. Arthur Costa had established a lead smelter on the River Avon at Rownham in 1685, which was to be a prototype for future copper smelters. Abraham Elton established the first copper smelter on the River Avon at Conham in 1696. And in 1710, the Brass Company established an additional smelting works downstream of Conham at Cruise Hole, managed by Arthur Costa's brother, John. This map of 1690 of the River Avon as it flows through Roundham Passage shows a group of buildings on the West Bank described as cupolo. This was Arthur Costa's lead smelter the term cupolo referring to a reverberatory furnace. Such furnaces have been the subject of a patent taken out jointly in 1678 by Lord Grandison and Samuel Hutchinson for a new invention to melt and refine lead ore in close or reverberatory furnaces with pit coal, sea coal or turf peat or other mixed fuel not mixed with wood or charcoal. This was to be the prototype for copper smelters which were to be key to the advancement of the Bristol brass industry. A significant issue was the use of coal. Prior to this date, metalworking required the use of charcoal, which burns without releasing harmful gases. Coal could generate the necessary heat, but also released impurities, most significantly sulphur, which would damage the metal being worked. But charcoal was becoming scarce and hence expensive. The breakthrough to enable the use of coal opened up an opportunity for smelters working on coal fields such as Kingswood. The drawing on the left is of a reverberatory furnace observed by Schluter, a German traveller and diarist, in the Avon Valley in 1738. The key parts of the furnace are the firebox, the bridge, the working bed and the chimney. Coal is burnt in a firebox separated from the metal being worked by a bridge. Air is drawn up through the firebox, over the bridge, along the roof of the furnace by the draught of the chimney. The heat from the fire is reflected or reverberated from the roof of the furnace onto the metal being worked, whilst the harmful gases are drawn away and discharged up the chimney. The furnaces were arranged in banks with multiple halves in a furnace house, as shown in this sketch of 1717. The sketch also emphasises the amount of smoke and fumes generated by the furnaces, the fumes being a combination of combustion products from coal, sulphur and arsenic. Two Swedish observers recorded the smelting furnaces on the River Avon, Henrik Kalmeter visiting in 1725 and Reinhold Angerstein in 1754. Kalmeter recorded 24 furnaces operating at Cruise Hole, capable of producing 200 tonnes of copper per year. 29 years later, Angerstein observed that the number of furnaces at Cruise Hole had risen to 49, with an additional 17 at Conham, making 66 in all. This sketch is from Angerstein's diary and shows the bank of closely packed furnaces at Cruise Hole. Benjamin Don's map of five miles around Bristol, published in 1769, also records the copper smelting plant at Cruise Hole, with the location of the cupolas being annotated. The map also shows Baptist Mills, which was the headquarters of the Brass Company, and a number of the pumping engines associated with coal mines. 
Two mines of particular note are in Hanham and are in close proximity to the smelting works. Remains of the smelting works can still be seen at Conham. Their attention is drawn to the black building blocks used in the construction of the building. These are blocks of cast slag from the smelting process, known as dross. This takes us to the next stage in the production process. Large quantities of waste, known as slag or dross, were produced, being a compound of iron and the silica flux. The volume of dross produced is exemplified by these 20th century photographs of a street in Swansea, adjacent to a spoil heap of copper smelting dross. Swansea was to supersede Bristol in the 19th century as the centre for copper smelting because of its superior coal and was to become the world leader in copper smelting, being known as Copperopolis. The 1936 photograph shows how the spoil heap was encroaching workers' housing. By 1963, some attempt of reclamation had been made, but the mountainous heap still dominated the landscape. In Bristol, the corporation were concerned that the mountain heaps of dross at Cruz Hole and Conham were going to accumulate in the river and hinder navigation. The brass company were therefore directed to remove the dross from their site. The company's solution was to cast the molten dross into blocks as it was tapped from the furnaces and sell the blocks as a durable building material. Black Castle at Brislington is a spectacular example of such use. The castle was built in 1755 for William Reeve, the manager of the Cruise Hole Copper Works. Reeve lived in the mansion at Arnus Vale, and Black Castle was a folly in the grounds of his mansion, which contained pleasure rooms and offices. More importantly, the castle showcased the use of copper slag for stylish building. A popular use of the slag was for the capping of walls, a number of examples of which can be seen in the Avon Valley. Three examples are shown here, at Blaise Castle in Bristol, Compton Dando on the River Chew, and Kelston Park on the outskirts of Bath. Kelston Park is bounded by a slag-capped wall 1.2 kilometres long, where it borders the Upper Bristol Road, the park having been landscaped by Capability Brown in 1767. Having produced copper, it was next necessary to obtain zinc in order to alloy with the copper to produce brass. A predominant zinc ore is zinc carbonate, known locally as calamine. Calamine had been discovered on the Mendip Hills in the late 1500s, with outcrops being worked near Whirl. Richer outcrops were later discovered higher on the Mendip, around Shipham and Roborough, and these two villages were to become the centre of calamine mining, supplying the Bristol brass industry throughout the 18th century. By the 1850s, the mining of calamine on the Mendip had ceased, but evidence can still be seen of the spoil heaps and the numerous mine shafts, the landscape so created being known as Gruffy Ground. Some initial processing was carried out on the Mendip, with the ore being separated from the waste in a similar manner to the separation of copper ore from the gang. A number of reverberatory furnaces were also erected near the mines, which were used to convert the zinc carbonate to zinc oxide as a precursor to alloying with copper. The remains of one of these furnaces still stands on private land in Shipham. Having smelted copper and obtained zinc in the form of calamine, the next stage was to alloy the metals to produce brass. But the alloying process is complex, which, despite a number of initiatives going back to the time of Queen Elizabeth I, had not been perfected in England. The centre of excellence for brass manufacture on the continent was the city of Aachen in Germany, close to the modern day borders of Belgium and the Netherlands. Abraham Darby, was tasked by the Bristol Brass Company to travel to the region and observe the methods employed. The results of his travels are best described by Hannah Rose, the daughter of Darby's chief technician, who states in an account of the lives of her ancestors that Abraham Darby and some more friends in Bristol hired the Dutchman and first set up the brass works at Baptist Mills. Darby not only observed the brass working methods, but also persuaded a number of skilled workers to emigrate and work in the fledgling British brass industry. Many of the workers were Calvinists and hence marginalised in the Catholic-dominated Continental Guilds. Darby was therefore able to offer not only employment, but also religious freedom. 
The family names of those early workers are found in clusters around the brass mill sites, and names such as Ollis, Frankham and Frey remain common in the region today. William Ollis, shown in the photograph, was employed at Cainsham Brass Mills in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, and was a ninth generation brass worker. The Brass Company established its headquarters at Baptist Mills on the River Froome, north of Bristol. This is a modern reconstruction of what Baptist Mills would have looked like in the mid 1700s. A key point to note are the large number of chimneys which served the furnaces in which the copper and zinc was alloyed to make brass by a process known as cementation. A contemporary description of the brass making process was recorded by Colonel Gallon, a French military engineer who published an account of his observations of brass melting at Namur on the River Meuse in 1749. Gallon described in detail the process for making brass using the cementation process. This image from his book shows three cementation furnaces, the raw materials awaiting processing, two workers carrying a crucible of molten brass to the casting moulds, and three moulds for casting sheets of brass. Gallon also provided a cross-section of the cementation furnaces. Superimposed on his drawing are a photograph of a reconstructed furnace at the museum at Dinar on the River Meuse, and also a diagram showing the workings of the furnace. Granulated copper, calamine and charcoal were packed into crucibles and placed on a clay bed laid on fire bars above an ash pit. Charcoal was also packed around the crucibles and the bed was pierced with, it, with air holes to permit upward flow of air to enable the charcoal to burn. The fire was lit and as the temperature rose the calamine sublimed, that is the zinc oxide changed direct from a solid to zinc vapour. This happened at around 950 degrees centigrade and the cloud of vapour was retained within the furnace to react with the metallic copper to produce brass. Raising the temperature further caused the copper to melt which occurred at around 1,083 degrees centigrade. But the alloying process was relatively slow and the furnace had to be kept at this temperature for around 12 hours to produce good quality brass. Once the alloying process was complete, the molten metal was removed from the furnace in a crucible and poured into a mould. The remains of a brass mould can still be seen at Warmley, which was developed as a brass works in the 1740s. The moulds comprised two granite blocks, typically 1.6 metres long by 0.9 metres wide, separated by iron bars around 7 millimetres thick, which was the intended thickness of the cast brass slabs. A clay slip was laid on the surface of the granite to provide a smooth surface on which to cast the brass. A windlass was used to raise the heavy upper granite block to prepare the mould. The final step at the foundry was to cut the brass slabs into smaller pieces called naps for distribution to the battery mills, a nap containing the required amount of material to produce a pan. And the slabs were cut using large shears operated by a number of men pushing against a long lever. Turning now to the manufacture of hollowware, one page of brass company accounts has survived from 1711. The accounts describe payments for melters, millmen and labourers at Baptist Mills. And the accounts also describe payments for millmen at Cainsham, Woodborough and Weston. And it is to these mills that we shall now turn our attention. The mill in Cainsham was Down Mill, later called Chew Mill, located on the River Chew in what is now Cainsham Park. And Woodborough Mill was also on the River Chew, four miles upstream. Western Mill was on the River Avon, on the north bank of the river, located on the island created when the Western Cut was dug in the 1720s as part of the Avon navigation. And these three mills were joined by a fourth mill at Saltford in 1721, located on the south bank of the river. Down Mill was leased by the Brass Company in 1705, having formerly been a grist mill. The mill was converted to a brass mill and continued in use as such until the 1870s. Thereafter, the mill was adapted for other use, eventually being demolished in 1954. Woodborough Mill was in use as a brass mill by 1711, 
having formerly been a tucking mill, and continued to be used as a brass mill until 1736, thereafter being converted to a grist mill. The building remained standing, having been converted to a private house. Western Mill was also in use as a brass mill by 1711, and was in use for over a century, eventually being sold by the Brass Company in 1811. The mill was thereafter adaptive to other uses, the buildings eventually being removed in the early 1970s to enable the Bath Flood Defence Scheme. And Salford Mill was leased by the Brass Company in 1721, having formerly been a grist mill and later a tucking mill. Salford continued in use as a brass mill until the company ceased trading in 1925. The four mills were brass battery mills, using water-driven trip hammers to shape the naps produced at Baptist mills into hollowware pans, basins and kettles. Hollowware was produced by cold working of the metal slabs cast in the foundry, the brass produced by cementation being malleable and ductile at room temperature. In his description of a brass mill, Gallon included a drawing of the trip hammers he observed recording that before 1695 all brass at Namur was beaten by hand and that this year saw invention of battery mills driven by water. The first of these mills was established on the river Meuse and its inventor was given exclusive privilege. In addition to Gallon's work we have a photograph of a set of hammers in use at Arschmill in Stolberg near Aachen in Germany in 1905. We also have a sketch of the hammers at Salford which were last used in 1908. The drawing was produced from a description given by Tom Shellard in the late 1960s. Tom was the son of the former of the mill and had worked there as a boy before the First World War. The hammers are clearly all of similar construction. When Abraham Darby introduced water-driven trip hammers and the skills to use them into the Avon Valley around 1705, the technology was therefore cutting edge. This design of hammer continued in use virtually unchanged for over 200 years. The shafts of the hammers, or helves, were about two metres long, pivoted off centre in a heavy timber frame sunk into the ground. The hammers were lifted by a series of cams mounted on a rotating shaft driven by a water wheel. The heel of the helve was driven into a toe plate, which bounced off the toe plate as the cam moved on, causing the hammer to be driven into the anvil. We have one hammer head found in the mill, which is about 40 centimetres long and weighs 10 kilograms and this was one of 450 different hammer heads recorded in an inventory of the mill taken in 1859. The stroke of the hammers was only about 5 millimetres, but this wheel turned at between 12 and 16 revs per minute, and with 20 cams on the drive shaft, the hammer struck at between 240 and 360 blows per minute, 4 to 6 blows per second. An observer of the shaping process using the hammers described the action as being more akin to a potter working clay than a blacksmith working iron. A replica of a single hammer has been constructed at Saltford to give an impression of the scale of the machines. Saltford Mill is a scheduled monument and Grade II star list of building, Historic England stating that the site is most impressively complete and an unusual survivor of the Bristol brass industry. The remains are unique in England and probably in Europe. Although over half of the mill has been demolished, we can still get a very good impression of what the mill must have looked like in the late 19th century. Given that there was very little development through the 19th century, what we see is probably reminiscent of the 18th century mill. In its final configuration, the mill was powered by four water wheels, two of which powered sets of rolls and two of which powered trip hammers. An inventory of 1859 describing two battery mills, each comprising three hammers driven by 15 foot water wheels. An archaeological dig of 1986 revealed the head of a pile on which an anvil had been mounted in close proximity to one of the water wheels. And this was taken as evidence that more extensive remains exist throughout the mill. Gallon provided an accurately scaled drawing of the mill at Namur, and the comparison of this layout and Saltford provides a very interesting insight. The mill at Namur has six hammers in one workshop, the hammers being in two banks of three, with each bank being driven by a water wheel. The 1859 inventory of Saltford 
also describes two banks of three hammers as at Namur a century earlier, albeit the hammers at Salford were housed in two workshops. We know which water wheels drove the rolls, which were introduced in the late 18th century for the more efficient production of sheet metal. We can therefore deduce which wheels drove the later hammers. If we overlay the outline of a bank of three hammers from Namur on the plan of Salford, we get close alignment between the anvil pile and one of the water wheels. Based upon this evidence, we can postulate where the two banks of later hammers were located in Salford. When the Swedish traveller and diarist Angerstein visited the mill in 1754, he recorded that the mill comprised three workshops and 12 hammers. There are therefore a number of possibilities about the location of the earlier hammers, one being that the mill initially housed only three water wheels, with each wheel driving a bank of four hammers similar to the arrangement at Stolberg. Although the brass was malleable and ductile at room temperature, Hammering of the metal caused it to work harden, making it brittle and liable to crack. For this reason, the work had to be periodically annealed during the manufacturing process, annealing requiring the workpiece to be heated to around 600 degrees centigrade to restore the metal to its ductile state. And the annealing process is the subject of the final part of this talk. The large chimney at Salford is an annealing furnace being one of four that once stood on the site. The annealing furnace is a muffle furnace comprising the chimney, within which is a firebox in which the fuel, coal, was burnt, and within which is a muffle, a sealed compartment into which the workpieces were placed to subject them to heat whilst protecting them from the harmful gases such as sulphur released from burning the coal. Furnaces such as this were an important innovation developed by the brass company and subjected to various patents. Annealing had traditionally been carried out on an open charcoal hearth, the charcoal providing the required heat without the release of sulphur. Angerstein recorded seeing such a furnace at Keynesham, making particular note that most of the annealing furnaces were fired with wood, but certain furnaces were fired with pit coal, placed in two narrow fireplaces either side of the hearth, a muffle furnace. Angerstein also showed the use of a turntable to speed up the loading and unloading process so that the furnace door was open for as short a time as possible. Here we can see inside the annealing furnace within Saltford Mill. The points to observe are the chimney, the firebox, the muffle, the door frame and partially built fire brick door, and on the left of the furnace a small auxiliary oven, more of which in a moment. The door is suspended from a counterbalance beam, pivoted in a frame mounted on a roof joist. The counterbalance beam enabled the heavy fire brick door to be quickly opened and closed by one man, with the furnace at operating temperature. In front of the furnace was a turntable. The original had disappeared, but a replica has been made to explain its operation. It would have been essential to have the door of the furnace open for as short a time as possible to keep the furnace up to temperature. The work pieces were therefore stacked on wheel trolleys, which could be quickly transferred between the furnace and the turntable. At the end of an annealing cycle, the completed charge bow was withdrawn, the turntable spun and the next waiting charge quickly loaded. At the side of the main furnace is a small auxiliary oven. This we believe was used to monitor the conditions within the furnace without having to open the main furnace door. We know that Josiah Wedgwood was experimenting with the development of a pyrometer to measure the temperature of his pottery kilns, using the properties of porcelain which contracted when fired. Measurement of the contraction, he postulated, would be a measure of the temperature within the kiln. It is believed that the brass workers used a clay or sample piece of metal whose characteristics would change over the annealing cycle. This would be placed in the auxiliary oven which backed onto the main furnace and could be monitored without disturbing the main charge. I hope that you have found this talk informative. If you wish to know more about Salford Brass Mill or the Bristol Brace Brass Industry in general, please visit our website at www.brassmill.com. The Salford Brass Mill project is a registered charity and the mill is maintained by a small group of volunteers who also open the mill to visitors, provide interpretive displays in the mill 
and delivered talks on the mill and the history of the brass industry in general to local interest groups. Please visit our website to find details of other talks in the series and background papers describing the industry and the process involved in more detail. Thank you for your time.